to Calvary, we are going to take that chorus again. It means, lead me, Lord, to understand the true meaning of your death and resurrection. It means, lead me, Lord, to Calvary to know what it means to me that you are risen. So as we take that song again, that lead me to Calvary, let us say, Lord, let me understand the true meaning of your resurrection. Lest I forget Gethsemane, lest I forget
victory over sin. When the devil came to Jesus to tempt Jesus to turn the stones into bread, it is not, it wasn't just a temptation of appetite. It was a temptation, the way I see it, of power, of proving a point. And that proving a point is personal pride that prevents us from forgiveness. I was joking with my husband yesterday, what could happen if I eventually decide to divorce him? And I was, we are rehearsing a script and we are laughing about it and I was telling him, and I will be still be checking on you because I want to make sure that woman is treating you well. And I will still be asking, I will still be, are you, are you sure you're not stressing my husband? I hope you allow him to sleep because he doesn't sleep on time. I hope you're not waking him up too early. We are laughing and laughing and then we went over to our children and I, I imagine she became looking at me. Are you fighting? <laughs> so we are just writing our script of, you know what, but that is not going to happen. We are just making fun of it and we are making fun of how couples could be stupid enough to divorce themselves, not just because something happened, but because one person doesn't want to forgive. And that is why, why many divorces happen. Somebody doesn't want to forgive. Not because they can't, but because they want to prove a point. That forgiveness is a sign of weakness. And so, victory in Jesus helps us to realize when the devil is trying to make us to continue in sin because we are engulfed in ego. We want to prove that we have power. We want to prove that if I do that, then after all the things I've said, after all the things I've done, you, will, you are engrossed in your ego and you're insane. Jesus did not need to prove to the devil that he was the son of God. So that was not just a temptation of appetite. It was a temptation of ego. Is there any way that we are engrossed in that temptation of ego and sin of ego that we may not even have been realizing it? After this message today, when you are tempted to do certain things and you say you don't want to do it, please pause and remember this message. I said, why am I not doing this? Because I want to keep my ego. Should I really do it? If you should, then swallow your pride because Jesus swallowed his pride. Jesus was stuck naked. I mean, we see him on the picture with a pack. There was no part. He was stuck naked for you. So, why wouldn't you swallow ego and do what Jesus wants you to do? The next aspect of that temptation was appetite. And appetite, just as we have understood in the past few months, thanks to Broyemi that's also told us that appetite is more than food. It involves sexual food. Appetite. And I always tell my children, I was even surprised the other day my daughter was saying it, that you hear no mom is always saying, if you can say no to food, you can say no to anything. Because it's a direct temptation before you say no. You can say no to food. You can say no to different types of food, not just spaghetti and macaroni. Different types of food, you can say no. Because you have a reason for saying no. You have a reason of saying no to sin. And it's not just about the immediate gratification. You can say no because you are thinking of the eternal consequences. So, resurrection of Jesus Christ brings us to, to remember that we have victory over the sin of personal ego and we have victory over the sin of appetite. One of the, I think that's the most um, common sin that we have today 
is the scene of wealth. And so the devil said, I will give you all this if you bow down to me. The devil will not come to you with horns and come to be like the devil. The devil will come to you knowing that you like money. And then he is trying to make you to do some certain things that it doesn't really matter. <laughs> and then you start compromising and start doing things that the Lord doesn't want you to do and you are bowing to the devil without knowing that you are bowing to the devil. Jesus' resurrection brings us victory over the sin of acquiring wealth no matter the means. Jesus' resurrection brings to our minds the victory of not just letting anything go, not just doing it because the world is doing it, but the victory of the assignment of understanding where is this really coming from. The victory of understanding who is truly behind an incident. The victory of understanding of who is really behind this. Is this really chocolate cake or is there something else in this that's making it black? The resurrection of Jesus Christ brings to our remembrance that we are victorious. We are not just victorious in sin, but that is the first victory that God wants us to know and live, and that is victory over sin. We are also victorious over sicknesses. And don't start asking me, why did your father die? But let me answer you that question. Why is my husband alive? Why is my daughter still alive and not taking her medication that was prescribed and by specialist doctors? <coughs> and why am I still alive and I've not been to the hospital in this country except for delivering of babies? Because I'm serving a God that has victory over health. Don't start bringing me the sins of the devil and start putting scenarios that the devil uses to accuse the brethren. If God is this, then why not this? No! Answer the devil by bringing out testimonies of what God has done. When you start presenting to, to yourself and to everyone the testimonies that the Lord has done, God will do more. Because he has given us victory over sickness. He has given us victory Actually, sometimes they are not really supposed to come. I mean, no sickness is supposed to come, but some just want to show their face. Like, let's, let's try. <laughs> and then if you take it for granted, it pops up. Yeah. So don't take any kind of signs and symptoms on your, on your health for granted. Take it seriously. And take it to God in prayer. Apart from going to see the doctor, take it to God in prayer. Because the devil may just be, let's see. If, if this Christian still knows that he or she has victory over illnesses. We have victory over sicknesses. We have victory over sin. And we have victory over every circumstance around us. That is the true meaning of Easter. Jesus wants us to understand that he's risen. Jesus wants us to understand that he's risen. Jesus wants us to understand that he's risen. Now, my question to you today is, what does it mean for Jesus to be risen in your life? When I was given this topic, I told my husband that my topic was supposed to be, is Jesus awake? He told me he didn't like that. But I said, okay, don't worry. But Jesus is risen. But I know where I'm going. And where I'm going is, in the storm, when the storm was moving the boat up and down, and the disciples were starting to throw away their possessions, Jesus was there, but he was not awake. He was sleeping, and that 
that is why they were going through what they were going through. Because Jesus was sleeping. Do you know that Jesus could be sleeping in your life? He's risen, but he could be sleeping in your life. It's like, okay, he, she, she doesn't have anything for me to do. So let me sleep. But my question today is, is Jesus awake in your life? Are you understanding the true meaning of the resurrection of Jesus Christ to you as a Christian? Do people see you and they know that this is a child of God? Do people see you and they know that, no, don't mess with that person. That person has an anointing of the Holy Spirit. And apart from people seeing you as a child of God, do you know your power as a child of God? Are you really understanding the power that God has given you as a child of God to you to listen? I am he that liveth and was there. And behold, I am alive forevermore. And I hold the keys of Hades and of death. I was asking my husband, so when he says that death will be thrown into the lake of fire, does it mean that death is an entity? My husband said, yes, death is a spirit. It is a spirit that erupted when Adam, when the devil disobeyed God and Adam, you know, followed suit. Then spirit started erupting. So, and this spirit is not immortal. It will be destroyed itself. Does it give you joy that death itself will be destroyed? I hold the keys of hate and of death. I hold the keys. And Jesus is telling you, I am risen. I hold the keys. Now the question is, Jesus, open the doors of life. Open the doors of life. Open the doors of victory for me. You hold this. I, I hold it. I have the key. And you are there. Say, hey, what will I do? Jesus, I hold it. I have the key. So what he requires from you is to tell him to open the door that you need to open. Open the door that you need to because he has the keys. He has the keys to victory. Victory to sin. Victory to, to, to sickness. That means you have health. Victory to life and not just life. Jesus said I have come that you might have life and have it more abundantly. Here and the life hereafter. So you start enjoying here. I said I hold the keys. Do you understand what it means for Jesus to be risen? Then you need to understand what it means for Jesus to be awake in your life. Because Jesus is already risen. It's an established fact. But is he sleeping in your life? Is he idle in your life? Are you not allowing him to fight the battles he should fight? Because you don't even know that you have a warrior in your life. Are you allowing Jesus to sleep in your life? He was not an emergency sleep. He 
said he was sleeping with his head on a pillow. <laughs> Permit me to say that Jesus was dreaming. <laughs> so he was not in a hurry. He said, okay, let me sleep. Calculated, prepared sleep. awake in your life? 